whenever you are anxious or fearful or doubting or lacking, Jesus has a response for you. And that is to the pattern of scripture I want to share with you in today's video. Every time that the disciples of Jesus were in a place of anxiety or fear or doubt or lack, he would tell them, O oh, you of little faith, why are you afraid? And seeing this pattern in scripture, how Jesus was addressing his disciples, actually got me to the place that I realized that every time we are anxious and fearful and lacking and doubting him, it means we are operating from a place of little faith. And in today's video, I want to speak from the topic, going from little faith to great faith. And I would like to go through the pattern of the indictment that Jesus was having against his disciples when he told them, why are you so anxious? Why are you in this place? Because it brings in the question that I asked, where is your confidence? It means it is like a parent or a father who loves the child so much, but the child has grown to a place that he or she says, I want to be independent. And whenever they get into trouble, they do not know how to come to their father to ask for help because they feel like, I want to be independent. I want to handle this on my own. I want to do this by my own strength, by my own capacity. And I feel like such a loving father would come to the child and ask the child, why are you believing so little? Why don't you have confidence in me? Where is your confidence? Why are you of so little faith? That is the picture that Jesus is coming with love, inviting them. I'm kind of frustrated with the way you are still operating below what I want for you. And I want you to get this, that Jesus did not indict the disciples, telling them, all you of little fasting, all you of little praying, all you of little reading of the Bible, or little time of study, all you of little this or that. That is from a religious viewpoint. Because most times they bring in this thought, telling people, if you fast more, Maybe you receive from God the more. If you pray more or for more hours, you're going to... None of this is wrong. It is not wrong to pray for long hours, not wrong to fast for as many days as you can. But then it should not be a thing whereby somebody tells you that if you want to get something from God, that you have to go through this pattern of fasting for so, so amount of days before God will do something. It sounds like a transaction to me and God does not transact with us. He relates with us because he knows each of us best. God knows you better than anybody else in the world can know you because he made you. He knows your heart. He knows everything about you intricately. He formed you with his own hands. So there's nobody else that knows you better than God. And that is why he wants to deal with you from a relationship viewpoint, not from a place of transaction whereby he's telling you you of little fasting. You're not fasting enough. That's why you're not receiving from me. So going straight to this, point number one is, why are you anxious? In place of anxiety, Jesus addressed the disciples by telling them, Oh, you of little faith, why are you worried? Why are you taking thought? And we find that in Matthew, where Jesus was telling them, don't take thought for what to eat, what to wear, what to drink. These are the things that the worldly people, it is a natural thing that anybody who does not know God would just think about. But your case is different. You have God. You should not be independent. You should be dependent in the one person. And it is the question, where did you put your confidence? Are you trying to do this life by yourself? Are you trying to do it by your own strength? Are you trying to do it by your own capacity? Do you know you have a loving father who really cares about you? So why are you anxious? He said to them, now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? So what is your greatest worry? What makes you worry the most? You should think about this, that when you start getting into that worry mood, it doesn't help you, it does not change anything, Instead, it worsens the situation. When you look at it squarely, why am I worried about this thing? How is it helping me? How is it going to help me in my life? You realize that it's not going to help you. It's not going to add anything from your life. Instead, it's going to subtract. That is why you should listen to God. Because the root cause of that worry is because you don't have confidence in God. Your confidence is either in yourself 
or in other things that you should not put your confidence in. If God so clothes the wildflowers that will die, what about you that he loves? How much more will he clothe you? If God so fits the birth of the air that do not sow or reap or gather into bands, how much more you? So why are you anxious? The root problem is your confidence is in the wrong place. Bring it back to God. Whenever you are anxious, Paul said, instead of staying in your anxiety, bring your request to God with thanksgiving. And let's read that in Philippians. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. How beautiful is this? For you to know that the peace of God, shalom in the Hebrew, because Paul is a Hebrew person, it means wellness, prosperity, and everything you need is inside the peace of God. It says whenever you are anxious, put your confidence in God and come to him in prayer. Instead of worry, instead of anxiety, turn it to prayer and petition and thanksgiving. Which means, God, this is my worry. I am afraid of tomorrow. I don't know what tomorrow holds. Right now, looking at my capacity now, I cannot even know when I'm going to get married. If that's your worry, I do not even know because I don't have the money. I don't have the finances to do this. I don't have the finances to do that. So I don't know how my life will turn out. God, I present this to you. And I thank you because you are my provider. I thank you because you are my source. And that is you presenting that request to God. And when you present it to him, leave it there. And allow his peace to wash over you. And the Bible says his peace will guard your heart. So that instead of you complaining, you stay in a place of thanksgiving. Lord, thank you because you are my source. I'm confident that you are my source. Two, so, why are you fearful? When Jesus was with the disciples in the boat in the sea, Jesus was asleep in the storm. Wow. That is the kind of peace that I want. The peace of God. He was asleep in the middle of the storm. That did not mean that he did not care, but it meant the troubles outside could not affect his peace on the inside. And that is why you have to realize that peace is not quietness. It is not the absence of trouble or the absence of chaos, but it is you having this certainty, this confidence that even in the midst of whatever is happening, you are confident in God. It is the presence of God in the midst of everything you are going through. It is knowing that I'm not alone. So why should I fear? But at this point, the disciples of Jesus could not get that. So they went to him and told him, Master, don't you even care that we are going to die and you are sleeping? The storm is raging and it's filling the boat and you are still asleep, God. And Jesus woke up. And the Bible says, when Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? This is still showing you that the root problem for your fear is because your confidence is not in God. You have little or no faith in God concerning your protection. You have little or no faith in God concerning your safety. You are not dwelling in the secret place of the Most High, like the scripture says, that whoever dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And you need to get to this place in your faith that you know that I am not alone. I am not walking alone. David said in the Psalms, though I walk through the valleys of the shadows of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You have to come to a place of knowing that when you are fearful or when fear grips you and you dwell in that place, your confidence is lacking in God. You are believing God little. And I, I, I hope you get this because if you get this, it's going to transform your life. Whenever fear comes, you have to present that fear and show the fear that you are not alone. If you really believe what the Bible says that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, you would know that you are not alone. You are not walking alone in life. You have the Holy Spirit of God inside of you who is a comforter, a counselor, in a place whereby you would need counsel. He is there. He is a standby. So what do you need in life that you will not get? If not that, 
you are believing God little. You don't want to ask much of him. You are trying to still be independent because that was the mood that we were pushed into after the fall. And you need to return back and know that your place is in Christ, not outside of him. Scripture says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, For God has not given us the spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. And again, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, it says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. And this is to let you know, by the time you are so certain and have your assurance and confidence in the love that God has for you, that you are loved, fear would not have any room. The disciples were afraid because they told Jesus, don't you care? And that is the place of doubting God's love for them. And that's the place of saying, no, I'm not sure this man loved me. We are not sure of this man's love for us. So when you are uncertain of the love of God, fear is the next response. And you need to come to a place of knowing that you are loved. God loves you. So there is no room for fear. If I ask you the question again, where is your confidence? You should be able to answer, my confidence regarding my safety, my protection, and everything I need in life is in God. No matter what I walk through in life, I am not alone. My confidence is in this one person who I know loves me. Number three, why do you doubt? Now, when Jesus called Peter out, you know the scripture, if you read the Bible, that Jesus called Peter out of the boat when he was walking on the water and they were afraid, they were frightened, thinking he was a ghost. Jesus told him, come, because Peter requested to come meet Jesus if it was really Jesus. And when Peter walked up to Jesus, his focus was on Jesus and he was walking until his focus left Jesus to observe the wind and the distraction led him to start sinking. And this is the place most times that we find ourselves doubting God because our focus gets distracted. Whether it's by the case of this life, whether it's by the storms that we face in our individual lives, maybe in your marriage, in your relationship, whatever chaos that distracts you is only leading you to doubt God. It's only leading you to disbelieve God. And Peter came to a place, he was obeying and focusing on Christ and walking on water until he started sinking. But I love the Lord because the Lord never left him alone. When he cried out, Lord, save me, Jesus stretched forth his hand and helped him. And let's read that scripture. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith. Again, Jesus said, why did you doubt me? This is a real place for me because when I think about myself, I realize that every time that I lose track of my focus on Jesus, of my focus on my faith in him, I start sinking into the sea of my emotions, of my feelings. My feelings start overcoming me. I start getting immersed in my feelings that at this point, any kind of anxiety can hit me, any kind of fear can hit me, and this is a place of me doubting God. Not as if I doubt that God exists or that I believe him, but I'm wavering. I'm releasing my confidence in God, trying to look inwards into me, and most of us get to that place that we release our confidence in God and start looking inwards into ourselves as if we even have the power or the ability to help ourselves. What is the lesson that I learned from this? Whenever I start seeing myself distracted with whatever thing or with whatever distraction, I should direct my focus back to Christ. Because the place of me releasing my confidence in Him is starting to look away from him. He's starting to look away from him who is the perfecter of my faith. Scripture says in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. If all of us can learn from Jesus how to ignore some things and despise some things that are distracting us just to focus on Jesus, we would not have issues like we are having. And the last place of indictment 
that Jesus had against the disciples was when they were adding a lack mentality. It is a place of forgetting what God has done for you already. It is a place of losing memory. And what am I trying to say? Most times when we get to complain and worry about provision from God, it is because we forget that he has been good to us, that he has provided for us, that he has been faithful to us. It's as if we are short-sighted and we don't have gratitude. Such that we would look back and see what God has done for us over time, how he has provided, how he has come through in the times of our lean resources, what would make us not trust him. And this was a place that Jesus got to with the disciples and he was asking them, why is it that you don't have any faith? Do you remember what I did when I fed the 5,000 people with five loaves? In Matthew chapter 16, the disciples were arguing that they did not carry bread along with them when Jesus was saying something that was not even related to that. And their own argument was, oh, we did not bring bread. And they were worried about that. And he got Jesus to speak to them again and indict them as if it's like, is that if somebody is like, I'm frustrated with you guys. Jesus knew what they were saying. So he said, you have so little faith. Why are you arguing with each other about having no bread? Don't you understand even yet? Don't you remember the 5,000 I fed with five loaves and the baskets of leftovers you picked up? Or the 4,000 I fed with seven loaves and the large baskets of leftovers you picked up? This is Jesus saying, you have so little faith, people. I've done all these things for you and you don't remember. You've forgotten. And this is like a, a call to you and I that when we tend to forget, we have to remember, recall to mind that God has been faithful. God has been good to us. So, so good. That God has provided for us. He has always been there. It's for me to know as a person that God is actually my source. Nothing else. It is not even my hustle or my struggling to get things that makes me have. The Bible says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. So when I realize that I have a source and the Lord is the one who supplies everything that I need, why should I be overly concerned about lack? Because by the time I'm overly concerned about lack, it is showing where my faith lies. It's actually showing that my confidence is not in God, but I'm focusing on myself. I'm focusing on my capacity. I'm focusing on my ability. Now, let me give you this bonus point from little faith to great faith. When Jesus talked about little faith, it was always about the disciples not understanding what he has done, not understanding his heart, not knowing the heart of God. And this is to open our eyes to know that by the time we are anxious, fearful, doubting, and overly concerned about the lack that we find around us, it means that we have little faith. So it's for you to come to a place of what is great faith. Now there are two people in the scriptures that Jesus referred to them by himself that they had great faith. And these people were Gentiles. The first was the centurion whose servants Jesus healed. And the second was the Gentile woman whose daughter Jesus healed. The amazing thing for me about these two people is that they did not even receive the healing for themselves. The faith they had going to Jesus was for other people, which is the woman for her daughter and the centurion for his servant. And I'm like, wow. Now the centurion approached Jesus and told Jesus, I am a man under authority. And when I give all that to people, they carry it out. So it's as if he's telling Jesus, I know you have authority and I believe in your authority. If you read in Luke chapter 7, from the starting of the story, the Jewish people came to Jesus and said, this man has built a synagogue for us. You need to go and heal his servant because he deserves it. But when the man came by himself, he told Jesus, I don't deserve, I don't deserve for you to come under my rule. Speak just the word. And when Jesus saw this, he said, such a great faith. Now let's read Jesus' response to this man's faith. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. No man has ever told Jesus, speak just the word. But this man understood the authority that Jesus had. And he had faith wholly in Christ. And that is what makes of great faith, which is you coming without pretense, 
coming with humility and trusting God wholly. You can see also with the Gentile woman when she came to Jesus at first, she actually came with pretense in Matthew chapter 15. If you read the, the whole story, you get it straight. She came to Jesus and pretended to be a Jew. And Jesus knew that she is not. So Jesus did not answer her. The disciples were telling Jesus, send this woman away because she is shouting and following us. Jesus said, he didn't even answer the disciples, but what he said must have touched the woman to let her know, I know who you are. You don't have to pretend to me. He said that I came for the lordship of Israel. At this point, the woman realized that, yeah, she is pretending and he, she has been caught. She's like, oh, I've been caught. Now, Lord, help me. Now she's coming like she is. And the Lord told her, healing is the children's bread. It's not meant for dogs. Now this would sound like, why would Jesus call me a dog? Is it because I'm asking you to come heal my daughter? You're calling me a dog. You're abusing me and all of that. But she was not offended. She understood. What a faith. She said to Jesus, Lord, you are right. It's true. But even the puppies, the dogs, eat the crumbs from the master's table. And Jesus said, dear woman, Jesus said to her, your faith is great. Your request is granted. And her daughter was instantly healed. Now, these are Gentiles, people who were not in Israel, who had faith in Christ, who believed him wholly. What is this to teach you and I? It is to tell you when you come to God, great faith is you coming without pretense, coming in humility, coming as you are and trusting Christ wholly. The way I would put it is, little faith is me-centered or I-centered. It's always about me, my capacity, what I can do, my service to God, the hours I spend in the place of prayer, or maybe the times I spend to read the Bible. So that I can have what to present to God as if God is interested in this transaction. Like God, I've been praying all night. I pray all midnight. So I deserve for you to do this. No, he says, no. I'm not here to transact with you. I want you to know my heart. I want to help you. I want you, be I want you well than you even want yourself to be well. I want you better than you even want yourself to be better. That's why the Bible says that God will give you exceedingly abundantly more than you can even ask or think or imagine, which tells you that God wants you well more than you even yourself wants to be well, my God. So if you can know his heart and trust him wholly, that's where great faith is built. In conclusion, do not forget that for your anxiety, for your fears, for your doubt, and for being concerned with lack, Christ's response to you is have faith in God. Come to me wholly with these things. Come to me and know that you are loved. Come to me and know that I am with you. Come to me and know that you are not alone. In the place of fear, we are walking together. My spirit is inside of you. Thank you so much for watching this video. And I hope this video has been beneficial to you. If it has been, let me know in the comment section. And let me know which part of this video spoke to you. And let me know your thoughts also concerning this video. Do well to subscribe to this channel and give this video a thumbs up and share it to your friends, to your families and everyone that you know who would have need of this message. Thank you. My name is Uwe McBan. This is my YouTube channel. I would love to see you in my next YouTube video. Bye-bye.